good to be here. And Sarah, thank you um, for that lovely introduction and being, for being such a, a wonderful host. And I want to thank um, the Center for Sustainable Environment and everyone else at Franklin and Marshall College who's made my visit possible. I was telling Sarah this is my first speech after the summer break. Um, so if I'm a little creaky, bear with me. There's much to discuss, um, as, as, as Sarah mentioned. I am going to be speaking about the climate crisis and the multiple crises we face. We don't live in a time where there is just one urgent crisis that demands our attention and action. We live in a time of overlapping and intersecting crises. Um, and so one of the things I want to talk about is how we can get out of the frame of our single issue silos and some idea that, they, that these crises are um, competing with one another um, for our scarce attention um, and activism and try to reframe these crises as a singular crisis, in fact, um, that we need to respond to together. Um, but I'm actually going to begin with something personal um, because I've been thinking a lot about what it takes for a crisis to be a wake-up call. And that is really a theme that, that runs through my work. Um, you know, s since I started making documentary films and, and, and writing books, uh, they really are all in one way or another uh, about how groups of people respond to crisis for the better and for the worse. Um, and I think part of the reason why this theme interests me comes from an experience I had in my own life. When I was 17 years old, a really um, handful of a teenager, I can tell you, um, I, was, I had a really rough relationship with my family, with my parents. I was sort of borderline delinquent. Um, and my parents went out of town one weekend. Um, and as usual, I had made a huge mess um, in the house with my friends. And I got a call from my father, who told me to meet him at the emergency room because my mother had had a stroke. Um, she was younger than I am now. Uh, my mom uh, is uh, an amazing woman. Um, she uh, made controversial documentary films. She was very active in the women's movement, um, very active physically. Um, and in an instant, she went from being this person who um, was so strong and able to having absolutely everything knocked out, including her ability to breathe um, and her ability to swallow. And I had this experience of suddenly having to change. Um, and um, it was as if in my own life, in my own body, a fast forward button was pushed. And I had to just go from being a kid to being an adult overnight. And this is something that a lot of young people experience a lot younger than 17 years old. Um, but my relationship with my mother, even though she couldn't speak, um, we managed to talk, even though she could only blink back. Um, I managed to figure out how to help my father, who I had been previously at war with. Um, and I figured out how to be a caretaker, as opposed to just a taker of care, which I had been up to that moment. <clears throat> and this is, as I said, it's not unique. We know that crises test us. Um, there are moments when we either fall apart um, or we find reserves of strength, muscles we didn't know we had. It's rarely status quo, though, is it? Um, it usually goes one way or the other when we have those big tests. And that is true, I believe, for societies as well, when societies are confronted with shocking events that rupture the sense of, um, of, of who a society thought they were, right? A shock is not just something big and bad happening, it's something big and bad happening for which a society does not have a narrative, a story, right? That's why for a lot of white people in this country, Trump's victory came as a shock a lot of liberal white people, and a lot for a lot of people of color in this country, they say, well, we're not shocked. We saw this coming. We had a narrative. We understood where this was coming, right? 
When we're in a moment of shock, we are vulnerable. We're vulnerable to people coming in with their stories of how we arrived at this moment. So there is, there is no shortage of potential wake-up calls. Sarah listed a few of them. Uh, Houston, underwater, and all of that, that record-breaking rain mixing with petrochemicals, uh, creating this toxic soup that overwhelmingly impact the low-income communities of color whose, whose neighborhoods were cited where the dirtiest industries were in the first place. Um, we also see the way climate impacts exacerbate pre-existing crisis in the way Hurricane Irma whipped through the Caribbean and southern Florida. That people who had resources to protect themselves, like if you're Richard Branson and you have a wine cellar um, to, 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 to take cover in, um, you know, you're going to lose a lot, but ultimately you're going to be okay. You've got insurance, everyone's safe. Um, but that is not the case for the so many people who were left to the elements. And then you have this overarching injustice on top of that, um, that the countries that were hit the worst by Irma are poor countries with a very low carbon footprint, right? Did very little to contribute to the warming of our planet that is supercharging every one of these disasters. And when I say supercharging, I'm not saying causing, right? These storms would have happened. They would have happened. But the baseline is higher. We are living in a warmer world already. And that is supercharging the kind of extreme weather that we're seeing. Wildfires are not new. But the reason why every time you turn on the news, you hear this phrase, record-breaking, record-breaking. A few weeks ago, Los Angeles was battling the largest fire within its city limits um, in, its, in its recorded history. I'm Canadian uh, in British Columbia. Um, the wildfires that are still happening right now burned more landmass than has ever happened in recorded history of the province because the baseline um, is hotter uh, and drier to begin with. Also because there's more f what, what they call fuel, right? More dry, dead wood. Some of that is bad forest management, but some of it is the pine beetle or, par or, or, or bark beetle infestation, which is, uh, there's some pretty compelling evidence is also linked to climate change. I'm not going to get into all of the science there. Um, but certainly, there's, there's, there, if we're looking for a jolt, a shock, there's no shortage of it. You know, in, in, in climate change um, discourse, you often hear the frog in boiling water analogy, like that sort of, I think, a really overused metaphor. Um, and, uh, and the idea is that the reason we don't act in the face of the climate crisis is, you know, if you put a, a frog in boiling water, it'll jump to safety. But if it's a slow boil, right, if you put them in when it's cool, they'll just sit there and cook. But I, I don't think that that's the situation we're in right now. Um, I think there are plenty of jolts. And on top of these climate jolts, climate-related jolts, we see fascists on the march open, um, open expressions of white supremacy in Charlottesville and in other parts of the country at the highest reaches of power, um, and a crisis of humanity in the way we as a species are responding to the fact that so many humans are on the move right now um, because of climate stresses, military conflicts, um, and poverty are moving and are finding fortress borders. Here in Europe, um, thousands of people have been left to drown in the Mediterranean. If we are looking for a wake-up call, we don't need to wait. <laughs> so what is happening with humanity's alarm clock? Um, there are precedents of responding to climate change differently than the way we are responding to it right now. What we are seeing so far is an example of what I wrote about in my book 10 years ago, The Shock Doctrine. Right? What The Shock Doctrine chronicled was how, over the past 40 years, when there have been large-scale shocks, um, a, a market crash, for instance, a, a, a war, um, 
and also weather-related shocks like Hurricane Katrina, what we've seen again and again is in the shock and confusion and disorientation that necessarily follows an event like this, there has been a very concerted strategy on the right to move in to that disorientation and push through very radical pro-corporate policies that it further divide societies, further enrich elites. The ultimate example of this is the way um, the Bush administration responded to Hurricane Katrina. When I start the shock doctrine and end the shock doctrine with Hurricane Katrina because there was a meeting in Washington while New Orleans was still underwater that was at the Heritage Foundation. Um, it was a meeting of all the right-wing think tanks in Washington, and it was hosted by the Republican Study Group, and they came up with a list that was leaked to the Wall Street Journal of free market solutions for Hurricane Katrina, so-called free market solutions. Remember, the city is still underwater, and you look at this list, pr don't reopen the public schools, give parents vouchers that they can use in private schools, um, uh, have, have charter schools instead of public schools, um, you know, don't reopen the public housing projects, create a tax-free free enterprise zone, create new capacity for oil refining, um, open the Arctic National Wildlife re Refuge to drilling. What? This is, uh, this, is a, this is a response to Katrina, a crisis that was created through the collision of heavy weather and a weak and neglected public sphere, and overlaying it all systemic racism, and the so-called solution is to burn more oil and attack the public sphere altogether. But if you look at that list now, you can put a check mark next to almost every single one of them, and the name at the end of that list is Mike Pence because he was chair of the Republican study group at that time. So what are we seeing? More of this, more, of di more disaster capitalism, more using these moments of shocks to do some of the most dangerous things that this administration have done, has done so far, repeal DACA, uh, pardon Joe Pio. Um, and uh, as Irma was descending, and when it looked like it was going to be at, at its maximum danger, six million people in Florida were under evacuation orders, and it really looked like it was going to rip through that state, Trump chose that moment to tell his cabinet that this was the moment, in his words, to speed up tax cuts. <laughs> um, and, you know, I'm not going to go through point by point the main argument, and this changes everything, um, because there's a lot of other things to talk about, but you know, the, the argument I make in that book is that the reason why we have failed to respond to the crisis of climate change is because doing so represents a absolute frontal challenge to the ideological project that began on the right but really became a bipartisan project that in most parts of the world is called neoliberalism, and the key policies are privatization, deregulation, tax cuts offset by cuts to social spending, all locked in under corporate-friendly trade deals. Now, if, you, if, if it is your religion to advance this very profitable ideological project, then you've got a problem when it comes to climate change, because you don't need to cut taxes when you see a hurricane that is going to leave you with a multi-billion dollar bill. <laughs> that is the moment to increase taxes, <laughs> uh, if anything, on the wealthy. It is the moment to uh, cut carbon, which requires exactly the kinds of regulations that Scott Pruitt has waged war on at the EPA. Um, and uh, this is why we haven't acted, not because we can't act, not because there are no policies, but because this particular economic project is at war with the things we need to do, the most basic things, invest in the public sphere to transition to 100% green energy, invest in public transit. We're cutting all of these things. We're doing the opposite, right? Um, so we are seeing the shock doctrine so far in response to these disasters. We shouldn't be surprised. There are many more examples of it right now in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico lost um, power on a massive scale, even though they weren't hit by the worst um, of Irma, but that is now being used as the argument for why Puerto Rico's electricity grid should be privatized, right? Um, so this is another example of the shock doctrine. So 
We also know that there are different ways of responding to crisis. And in fact, the argument I made in the shock doctrine is that um, <clears throat> this whole strategy was developed as a response to the victories of the New Deal, as an, a, based on an understanding that left to their own devices, crises that expose the failures of a current system tend to lead to progressive change, not the kind of change that I've described. And the classic example of this is what happened after the market crash of 1929, right? Deregulated capitalism, let's say fair capitalism collapses. Um, you've got stockbrokers jumping out of windows. You have millions of people being bush pushed onto the bread lines. Um, and you have a very organized population that demands change. Uh, and th it is in this context that huge social program victories are won, like social security, the attempt to weave a social safety net so that people are never so precarious enough. It is never, again, it is never possible to slip through the cracks in the way um, that we saw in the 1930s. Uh, we also saw the huge investments of the New Deal in this period, major investments in public housing, in electrification. Um, and we saw serious banking regulation, exactly the stuff that Bernie Sanders was promising to bring back. Laws like Glass-Steagall, which broke up the banks, bro broke apart the investment banks um, from the savings banks. Um, so that was a crisis that served as a wake-up call, it would seem, right? People were shocked, oh my god, <laughs> we have to fix this. But it's more complicated than that, because it was a crisis that unfolded at a very specific time in history. And I want to be clear that the New Deal was not in any way perfect. Um, African American labor was systematically excluded. Women's labor was systematically excluded. But if we look at the legacy of the New Deal, as well as the legacy of the kinds of investments that were made in the aftermath of the Second World War, another kind of crisis, um, we see where the social safety net came from. We see where so much of what is being dismantled now and has been under attack over the last 40 years, where it came from. Um, so, so it did not happen just because something shocking happened. It happened because this was a moment of revolutionary thought. I mean, the working class in the United States at the turn of the last millennium was versed in Marx, in W.E.B. W. Du Bois, was inspired by the Paris Commune, could imagine another way to organize society. So it was a period of intense organization um, at the local level, at the union level, at the neighborhood level. Um, and it was also this period where people were not afraid to dream in public about the world they wanted instead. So they had their nose to the desperation, um, to the brutalities of the current system, but also had a picture in mind of another way to organize society. There was a utopian imagination um, that existed. And it was in that context that a shocking event like the crash of 1929 could be that wake up call. So how does that compare with where, where we're at? Um, Sorry, I just, I was, um, okay, <laughs> I lost my timer. So where are we? We are living at a time of tremendous political engagement. Um, we're obsessed with politics. Uh, a lot of people are getting involved in politics for the first time. A lot of people are spending their weekends marching, um, signing up, phone banking, acting. Um, we're getting really good I think on the progressive side of the spectrum of saying no to what we don't want. <clears throat> and we're even winning some victories. But when it comes to proclaiming boldly, without shame, uh, what the world we actually want looks like, painting a picture of the world beyond the one we have right now, things tend to get a little bit tentative, a little bit hazier. Uh, and I think there are many historical reasons, which I don't have time to get into now, about what, what happened to the, the progressive imagination, um, to that willingness to speak about the world instead, uh, another, other kinds of futures. Um, some of it was the lived experience of socialism, or so-called socialism, in the Soviet Union, 
Some of it was the result of a very concerted war on the imagination that was central to the neoliberal project in the, through the 80s and 90s. And that, that war on the imagination can be summed up in two very famous phrases, one from Margaret Thatcher and one, one from Francis Fukuyama. Thatcher's was, there is no alternative, and Francis Fukuyama's was the end of history. Um, both, of these, both of these phrases, which became very famous, um, attempted to close the book on the story of how societies could organize themselves, right? Um, that how, whatever problems you might have with, a, with the way our market system is distributing wealth, um, any attempt to try to change that or do anything different will lead to something far, far worse and apocalyptic. There is no alternative. If you don't like it, lump it. This is all there is. That's what Thatcher was saying. And Francis Fukuyama was even bolder. He was literally saying that the history of humanity, the ability to change and progress, is now officially over. He announced that when the Berlin Wall collapsed. Um, and I think that as this, the project of neoliberalism has been in crisis really since the 2007 financial collapse, there aren't a lot of true believers out there that will make the argument um, that if we follow these rules, things are going to get better. But the legacy of that attack on the imagination has proved sturdier than anything else in the neoliberal project. But the spell is starting to break. And I think a lot of the reason why it's starting to break is that young people who came of age post-2008 financial crisis never received the hard sell of that war on the imagination. And so when they hear a Bernie Sanders or a Jeremy Corbyn talking about free education and health care for all, um, it just makes sense. And they haven't received the full propaganda. So we are starting to see a liberation of the imagination once again. When climate activists used to talk about changing the light bulbs, now we're talking about getting to 100% renewable energy by 2030 or 2040, getting all of our power from the sun, wind, and waves. Students are not just opposing the latest tuition increase as they were when I was in college. Um, they are calling for free public education and canceling of debt. Movements catalyzed by police violence against black bodies are calling for an end to mass incarceration, to militarized police, and even reparations for slavery. The vision for black lives is a, a document produced by the Movement for Black Lives. It is a utopian uh, document. It is, it marks, I think, a really significant reclaiming of that important, important history. So political horizons are getting longer once again, stretching beyond the immediate goals of any single campaign. But I think the problem we have if we want to compare ourselves to a moment of a radical change like in the 1930s or even in the 1960s when we had major environmental breakthroughs at the beginning of the 70s um, is that we very much still tend to think about these issues in boxes. There's the environment box, there's the racial justice box, there's the immigration box, which is a subset of that, but also separate from it. There's a women's issues box. Um, in movement jargon, this is known as silos, right? And so even if intellectually organizers fully understand the intersection between economic inequality and racial justice, the legacy of neoliberalism has placed people into organizations, professionalized NGOs, um, that keep us in our boxes, right? So we can understand something intellectually, but we're working within a system that has created disincentives to making connections. Generally, movements are not funded by members. They're funded by foundations. Um, they're funded by foundations that want deliverables. They want to know that their money um, led to a very clear win, which encourages movements to organize themselves around so-called winnable goals, right? So thinking small and winnable rather than big and systemic. And also, I think, 
all of us as individuals and also as organizations have been colonized by the logic of branding, of, of corporate branding. There's now a US president who is himself a brand and has children who are sub-brands. Um, but it's not just Trump. You know, what I say in, in No is Not Enough is that Trump is really just a mirror being held up to society in so many ways, this exaggerated forms of so, ma so many of these dangerous trends. So many environmental organizations have to act like brands, right? So what it, the problem with brands is that they're proprietary, right? Brands want to take the credit for whatever it is um, because that's how brands get more money. They go back to, the, to, the, to members, they go back to foundation, they said, we did this. Whereas movements are expansive, right? They say, it's all of us, right? And they reject that, that sort of ethos of scarcity and approach the world with open arms want as many people inside the movement as possible, rather than being so protective and policing the boundaries of the brand. And I say this not to accuse any, uh, these are fantastic organizations, I'm part of them, but we are within a system that has kept us from doing a lot of the things that we understand we need to be doing um, intellectually. <clears throat> The good news is there, there's a great deal of recognition that the siloing of our movements, the branding of our movements, um, is standing in the way of the kind of mass organizing that we need to be doing in this moment. Um, you have an amazing local example here with Lancaster Stands Up. I think there are some people here from Lancaster Stands Up. Yay! <laughs> yeah, and um, which is an amazing project of building new alliances, getting people out of their silos, identifying common ground, the threads that connect movements. I think there's some flyers that are circulating about an upcoming forum this Saturday um, with congressional and municipal candidates, so I'd urge you to, to get involved. Um, I want to talk a little bit, for the rest of the time I have, um, about an experiment that I've been a part of, uh, um, which is our version of, of silo busting, and, and maybe it'll inspire um, so, some of you. Um, so. A couple of years ago, a group of us in Canada were frustrated that none of the major political parties, we were in the middle of an election campaign, a federal election campaign, that none of the major political parties had a platform that we felt um, recognized the urgency of the climate crisis, were proposing policies that were actually in line with what scientists were telling us. All the major parties had picked one pipeline or another that they were backing and cheering. Um, and, um, and we also felt that they were failing to make the connections between issues. Um, so out of this sort of sense of frustration that we were not living up to what our historical moment demands of us, and I know you've all you know, heard wonderful things about Justin Trudeau, and I hate to burst the bubble, but um, he is not, in fact, the Messiah. Um, so, <clears throat> so what we did was we, we held a, a meeting, a closed door meeting of about 60 movement leaders, um, heads of organizations, grassroots folks. Um, you know, it, it was a, there was a really big range from large trade unions, the largest trade unions in the country, um, and small grassroots groups like No One Is Illegal, groups like Greenpeace, 350, um, indigenous leadership from, uh, you know, from very remote communities came in. And we did something that we realized we'd never done before, which is we made space to dream about the world we want. Now this group of, this group of people had come together in different configurations, or at least their organizations, but they had always come together in coalitions of the no, come together to say, we all don't like this trade deal, or we all really don't like this you know, piece of legislation that is you know, filled with cutbacks. We all agree on that. But we had never come together to try to map our yes. And so that's what we did. And it was really hard work, um, because that's what happens when you get people in a room with different worldviews, different experiences, painful histories of betrayals. We had an amazing facilitator who helped us work through all of that. And <clears throat> my job in, in all of this was to, to, to listen, to, to try to notice the clear threads that were emerging. And there were some really, really clear threads that did emerge out of this. Um, One was that we live in a system that is based on endless taking and extraction, as if there are no limits, 
and as if there are no consequences. And this is true of the way we treat the earth, and it is also true of the way we treat workers' bodies, and it is also true of the way we treat our shredded social safety net. We take and we take and we take as if there is no breaking point. And everybody is feeling absolutely stretched to that breaking point, and our, the planet itself is in that precarious state. So what we tried to map was less a list of policies, although there are 15 policies that came out of this, and more a shift in story from a society based on endless taking to a society based on caring for one another and for the planet. We do take as humans, but when we take, we have to give back, we have to take care. So what would that look like as a society? What would that look like in economic terms? Um, so we came up with this document. Originally, we'd hoped to come up with something that would fit on a postcard. It ended up being the length of an op-ed, <laughs> um, a bit of a long op-ed called The Leap Manifesto, and you can read it at theleap.org. Um, but I'll give you a couple of highlights of what came out of this attempt to come up with intersecting solutions. So the, 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 fa the premise of our gathering and the ground rules was nobody was allowed to play my crisis is bigger than your crisis. Um, we started from the premise that all of these crises are urgent, and we, we, they're so urgent that we can't solve them sequentially. So what we need are solutions that radically bring down emissions while closing the income inequality gap and healing the wounds that date back to the founding of our country. That was, that was, our, that was our mandate. Um, so in concrete terms, as we switch to 100% renewable energy by 2030, so we set this very ambitious goal that we've been told by um, by climate scientists we need to do, but we've been told by engineers like Mark Stanford's team, um, sorry, Mark Jacobson's team at Stanford that we can do on this very tight timeline for electricity by 2030 for the rest of the economy well before mid-century. So we said we're going to do that. But as we do this, we want to change how we generate electricity. We don't want a centralized system controlled by a few big corporations. We want energy democracy. We want communities to own and control their own renewable energy wherever possible, and whatever profits are made stay in the community to pay uh, for services. But we also, and we were inspired by the German example in that they were able to create 400,000 jobs in the, in, the, in the process of doing that. Um, but we also said we want to do better than that. We want the people who have gotten the worst deal under the current system to be first in line to own and control their own renewable energy. So we want indigenous communities and other frontline communities, uh, which are overwhelmingly communities of color, to be first in line. And this is how we don't repeat the, the, the injustices that were baked into the new deal, deal. That's why it has to be a justice-based transition. So that's one example. Um, <clears throat> another example is, you know, we obviously we went big on green jobs. It's very clear also um, that no worker can be left behind, that the workers in high carbon sectors have to be part of designing the training programs um, to get jobs in these new sectors. But we also wanted to completely redefine what a green job was. So we said, look, you know, even though environmentalists don't usually mention it, um, taking care of kids is not very high carbon. Neither is teaching them. Um, neither is caring for the sick. Neither is making art. Um, so we, you know, we can't, and, and these are all, this is all work um, that is under relentless attack by the logic of austerity. Um, much of it is work done by women, by overwhelmingly immigrant women. It is underpaid, it is underappreciated. Um, what if we invested in the care economy? And this is what we mean by caring for the planet and for each other. Um, so, uh, so that was one of the principles, frontline first, invest in the care economy, no worker left behind. And we also worked with a team of progressive economists on how to pay for this, because obviously this is expensive, but luckily we live in a time of unprecedented private wealth. Um, so we came up with a plan for how to go, go after a greater share of that wealth. Um, through increased royalties on extraction, um, through various kinds of wealth taxes, the exact opposite of what Donald Trump is proposing in the wake of Harvey and Irma. So polluter pays was, uh, was another core principle there. 
Uh, so we put it out there into, into the world in the middle of an election campaign. Our media didn't know what to make of it um, because here this was a people's platform and it was committedly nonpartisan. We said, we're not affiliated with any party. We Our original signatories um, had people from, prominent figures from all the political parties. Um, and so different parties would, you know, the Green Party tried to say, well, this is us. And we said, well, no, like, we're not any, we're not any one party. We want all the parties to endorse this. Eventually, the New Democratic Party, or, um, at the time, the official opposition in Canada, did endorse the Leap Manifesto after they did poorly in the election. They endorsed it because, um, because there was a revolt within the party where particularly young people felt that the reason they didn't do well is because they didn't go bold enough. They'd been really inspired by Bernie. Artists were very involved. We had uh, Leonard Cohen, who was still alive, was one of the original signatories of the Leap. There were a lot of musicians um, who signed on to it, a lot of actors as well, and 220 organizations with this really broad range of big sort of slick green NGOs, very grassroots groups like Bl Black Lives Matter Toronto sign. Um, and, um, and, and it ins has inspired different people to take this idea internationally, but what I'm really excited about is how people are localizing it. So now people are taking this blueprint that we produced and they're localizing it at the city level in Canada and in the United States, in Los Angeles, the city councilor there, uh, who's been a real leader uh, on climate, has struck a LEAP commission, um, bringing together indigenous activists, um, climate justice activists who have oil wells and gas wells in their backyards with green groups and unions to try to map a very ambitious plan for the United States' second largest city to embrace this principles of a true justice-based transition and to do it in a huge hurry. Um, so, like I said, we also got quite a bit of pushback. Um, <clears throat> I think that our na one national newspaper called it madness, another one called it a suicide pact for the country. Um, you know, we were attacked by several, um, you know, leaders of, of, of provinces, provincial premiers, um, and if anything, it helped us, to be honest. Um, this sort of intense overreaction to this document, which when they read, people were like, but this is beautiful. We want to live in this world. We want to live in this future. Um, and we were really um, committed to the idea of, of, you know, a, of presenting a vision of the future that was not nostalgic, that was not just like we want to turn back the clock to the 1960s or the 1950s. Um, you know, when you build a really broad coalition, that includes the people that were never included in those earlier dreams, you are forced to take inspiration from the future that, the, and from a vision that we have not lived yet, that we have not tried yet. Um, we also just obviously weren't surprised that something like this would, um, would create backlash because what we were proposing and what we continue to propose doesn't fit inside the box of what is considered politically possible at this point in history. And what we are trying to do with the leap is explicitly explode that box, that box of what is considered politically possible. Because if that box doesn't leave room for the safety of our species, then there is something very, very wrong with it. If what is considered politically possible today consigns us to a future of relentless climate chaos tomorrow, then we have to change what is politically possible. We live in this time of multiple overlapping crises, all are urgent. We are not going to pick and choose and play some kind of oppression Olympics. We need to map ways to do it all at once. I know from my own life, and I know that many of you must know from your lives that crises test us. We either fall apart or we grow up fast, finding new capacities and strengths we never knew we had. Crises can transform us if we let them, if we listen. Every alarm bell in our house is going off. It's time to listen. It's time to leap. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ryan Franklin. I'm an art history major and a senior. I know you previously said that the millennial generation is not as hindered by the neoliberalism you know, ideology and that we do have the ability to progress and think forwardly. But my question is, like, what measures or recommendations do you have for leaders in our own government who are adults and who have gone through that to kind of 
move past that and think beyond the actual scope of that ideology? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think it's happening. <laughs> I think it's starting to happen. I think we're seeing it, um, you know, we're seeing it really clearly with healthcare right now, um, where I think as, we're, as there are such aggressive attacks on policies that were never good enough in the first place, right? What we're seeing is um, millennial-led movements, and I would put Bernie's campaign in that category, um, stepping into that space and going, well, we're not just gonna defend an unacceptable status quo, now we're gonna go for what we really want, right? And so we're seeing that now with, med with the Medicare for All bill that Bernie just introduced and has now been endorsed by everybody who is being talked about as a possible contender in 2020. That's huge. I mean, to have Cory Booker endorse that, um, you know, with his ties to the insurance industry, I mean, marks a major change. The, the Democratic Party is being changed by millennials from below. Um, it may not get changed enough, but that is happening. Um, and we see it with, um, with the Corbyn campaign in the UK, where, uh, you know, that what, what he introduced in the last election was this very powerful platform. Um, and, you know, this is the, you know, one of the two major political parties in the UK, and they're very, very close to power right now. So we are seeing already um, electoral politics at the high, highest level being impacted by this infusion of, you know, useful, um, you know, I won't call it idealism. I think it's very pragmatic to go bold right now. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, good morning. I'm Raphael Lewis. I'm from Miami, Florida. Um, I'm a junior here at FNM. Um, my question is, I mean, recently I just finished my first book, uh, and I wrote it about um, figuring out identities um, about myself. And I figured that identities kind of like sometimes um, uh, kind of like give a sense of how you would react when certain, like you're going through certain challenges and I was wondering, to what extent do you think identities affect people's understanding uh, or prevent people's understanding of the effect of climate change mm -hmm. and the wake-up calls that you know you were talking about earlier? Yeah. Well, first of all, congratulations on finishing your first book. <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it's. It's a huge, it's, it's, it's a huge influence. Um, and, you know, we, we're, 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 it's hardest for us to absorb information that challenges our core identity, right? Um, and, <clears throat> you know, when you look at the data on where, on, on where climate change denial is, right? Um, it's, I mean, it's incredibly concentrated on the right. You know, among Democratic voters, upwards of 80% of people recognize that climate change is happening. Um, and I think that number is going to go even higher um, after this summer. But the, the further you are to the right, um, and what the social science data does is it, 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 it correlates it to a worldview, a dominance-based worldview is, is um, is the language that's used. So if you have a world view um, that says, you know, people who are doing well are doing well because they deserve it, and people who aren't doing well are, aren't doing well because there's something wrong with them, you know, they, they, if, if that's your world view, um, then you're very likely to deny climate change because it, cha it so directly challenges that world view. Um, that, so people build their identities uh, around lots of things. Um, including a sense of that whatever they have, they have because they deserve, right? Um, and I think climate change, because it so clearly impacts people who don't deserve it, didn't do anything to cause it, um, is a huge challenge, as well as the reasons why I, um, out, the reasons I outlined earlier, you know, from an ideological perspective, the kinds of policies that would be needed in terms of regulation and taxation is such a huge challenge to that identity, that they'd rather deny the science, and no event's going to serve as the wake-up call. 
Hi, <coughs> my name is E. I'm a sophomore. Um, so I've noticed that in a lot of points about issues surrounding capitalism and climate change, there's a very remarkable absence of talking about the animal agriculture industry. Um, and I'm wondering why you think that is and why that's something that you did not address at all. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that there's as much of a reticence as is sometimes suggested. I mean, I think that the, the data is really clear that, that energy is the, the, the biggest producer of fossil fuel, of, of greenhouse gas emissions. It's not agriculture. There's some bad data out there. And so I'm often confronted by people who have gotten their information from a film called Cowspiracy. And I, I can send you an article that explains exactly where that data comes from and what, what the problem is. Because that film says it's the number one. It's not the number one, but it is the number two. So it's still huge, right? So I'm not making an argument that it is, that, it, that it's, um, <clears throat> not important, but I am making the argument that, you know, I, I don't think there is a, a conspiracy. I think the reason why there's been this emphasis is because it is the, it is the largest. But I also think that it's, um, that it's hard to see how you legislate vegetarianism, right? Um, and so I think that this idea that it's going to all just be sort of voluntary is, um, not going to bring emissions down fast enough. So I think there's been a concentration on areas where we see policy possibilities that could bring emissions down very, very quickly. But agriculture is absolutely a huge piece of it, and not just animal agriculture. Um, it's industrial agriculture. It's not just animal. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm Emily. I'm a sophomore here. And recently, like in the past year, I've noticed that there's a conflict like with what it means to be an American in, like, recent times, and there's this conflict uh, concerning like economy and therefore um, climate change about like this whole historical factor, like, well, this is what our founding fathers wanted for this country, so we should always be like that. And so there was this argument for capitalism and like laissez-faire market for that reason, and I think it's also a reason why like the idea of socialism scares a lot of people because they immediately equate it with what Soviets called socialism mm -hmm. uh, versus what it actually is. Yeah. And so, like, how would you suggest combating that attitude? Because obviously there are lots of us who do not agree with that and, um, and are kind of insulted by the fact that, you know, criticizing our country, they call us un-American for that. So what would you say is a good way to kind of combat or debate that attitude in a way that's I guess, um, encompasses both parties and is a genuine and decent debate versus just name calling and shaming. Great question. I'm going to take a, two questions at once just because I, I know we don't have a ton of time. Sure. Uh, my name's Ian. I'm a sophomore considering environmental studies. I wanted to thank you for your shout out to Lancaster Stands Up. We're actually having a student interest meeting uh, at the end of the month. So um, my question is one where I've face this double challenge of knowledge and capability. Most folks don't know that solar employs twice as many people as the fossil fuel industry in this country. They don't know that the subsidies we give to the fossil fuel industry double that of the EPA budget. Um, and they don't realize that it's actually become cheaper than natural gas at this point. And my concern is that uh, I come from a family where both my parents worked sometimes 50, 60 hours a week and I ran into that same issue. Uh, preparing for college, there are folks here that are buried in textbooks how can we get students out who only have a couple of hours a week to spend? What kind of radical change can they make in a month or in a four year period in order to fight for renewable energy investment over the next 50 years? Hmm, hmm, hmm. These are great questions. <coughs> <laughs> wow. All right, Th we've got- These are your last questions. <laughs> oh. All right, let me hear one more. Let me hear just one more. I want to hear from you guys. It's all so interesting. Okay. Uh, <laughs> my name is Trexler. I'm a senior from Colorado. And my question, while I don't quite know how to phrase it, is uh, along the lines of renewable and sustainable development, um, as the process of implementing a lot of these renewable technologies, such as solar, uh, wind, different uh, 
I mean, they all have their own issues, storing energies with solar, um, batteries doing that. But I'm, my question is uh, around the resources necessary to build that infrastructure, yeah. f first domestically, but then on an international scale, like what are the biggest hurdles you see uh, for including like uh, a lot of the poorest people in the world are the ones mining the most toxic materials necessary to make solar panels or to make lithium ion batteries, um, as well as ecological destruction of hydroelectric. And I was wondering how that balances in because we do need renewable power, but yep. will the initial investment to get that renewable power be a greater offset? Yeah, so mm -hmm. these are all great questions. I don't have enough time to answer them because I'm getting a, <coughs> I have two minutes <coughs> from what I can see. Come to the reception, we'll talk. Um, so uh, there's no doubt that in addition to what you're saying, getting, y you burn fossil fuels to get off fossil fuels. I mean, we're talking about a sort of a new deal levels of investment. Um, and when you have a society built on fossil fuels, you're gonna burn a lot of fossil fuels to get off fossil fuels. And these are not, these are not non-extractive industries. I mean, they are renewable in the sense that their inputs are renewable in terms of wind, water, and wave, but the basic materials, um, you know, are, are, you get them through mining and you get them through some pretty dirty processes, as you say. Um, so I think this points to the fact that this is not just about flipping a switch and, you know, we get to continue on exactly as we are. And this, I think, um, ties in with your question about whether or not we're allowed to talk about capitalism. We have to. We have to talk about a society built on wasteful consumption, um, financial speculation, um, and we have to be t having conversations that are about what really makes us happy in life. And this is what we tried to do with the leap of like thinking about care work and thinking about different way, like the, investing in the parts of our economy that are not wasteful, um, that are not grounded in consumption, so that we can contract the parts of our economy that are grounded in consumption. Because we can't just act, keep on keeping on and acting as if um, there's no cost to that. So there is. People should find out about the DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, who are having this great conversation um, uh, raised of, you know, um, this idea that there is only one American way of life and it is, you know, endless shopping. There are different ways of being American. There are different ways of living. Um, and I would just encourage people to come to your, uh, to your, to, to your, what did you call it? Um, language stand session. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, I think it's a really exciting, I think it's a really exciting example of exactly the type of organizing we need. And when we get out of our silos, it means one person doesn't have to do everything. All right, thank you so much.